first speaker is Eric Rowell, and he's going to talk, but his talk is titled uh, Anions and Beyond the Mathematics of Anthropo Anthropological Faces. So, please. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, and I really appreciate the uh, invitation to come to Quantum Fest again. And it's, a, it's an honor to be here, and it's a pleasure to be back at Sindestav. The last time I was here was 12 years ago, when I'm visiting the math department. So, um, yeah, so uh, my talk is about anions um, and beyond, sort of to describe sort of how, um, how mathematicians think about anions. Um, so before I begin, I should uh, thank uh, my support. So my university is Texas A&M. Although this year I'm at Berkeley on sabbatical. Um, and, but also I have uh, some funding from the Simons Foundation. And um, I consult for Microsoft. And the NSF also funds my research. And so I meant to thank those. And um, right, so then Bar Quantum, of course, for organizing this. I didn't realize that it was a bar. Um, <laughs> but probably if I had realized it, it would you know, collapse and no longer be Yes. Um, okay, so let me um, say a little bit about topological phases of matter. So um, here's a definition uh, by some physicists. So um, they say that a system is in topological phase if um, its low energy effective field theory is, um, well, a topological quantum field theory. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a mathematician's definition, although the authors of this paper were physicists. Um, but we like this, so what does this really mean? Well, um, so these two words I put in extra color, low energy and effective, essentially correspond to, well, um, the temperatures are going to be very low, and so um, there's no uh, sort of issue with, um, with uh, sort of thermal fluctuations typically. Everything is sort of suppressed, so all of the classical things are suppressed, so it's very quantum. And then long wavelength, so that's what the effective field theory means, just means that um, uh, as long as uh, we're, we stay above some particular length scale, like if our quasi-particles are kept far enough apart, then this description is, is correct. Another way of thinking about it is that, um, so the, well, under these conditions, the observables are invariant under diffeomorphisms of space-time. So this is, uh, why it's topological. So there's no dynamics. That's all been sort of washed away because this is an effective field theory. Um, and so really what it comes down to is the topology is the key. So let's, let's see what else we can say. So some remarks about topological phases of matter. Um, not many people knew much about them until 2016 when the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded um, for topological phases of matter and um, well, the KT transitions, which are topological phase transitions. Uh, the work of the Nobel Prize winners uh, goes back to the 70s, so they've been around a while. But uh, anyway, that's kind of a recent thing. Um, what about spatial dimensions? I haven't said what dimension we're talking about. Uh, it turns out it doesn't matter. You can still talk, a lot, talk about topological phases of matter in uh, any spatial dimension, one, two, or three. Um, there are some separate kind of issues about whether you want to talk about bosonic theories, which I, would, I kind of think of as being theories where locality is very uh, strongly um, observed, um, or fermionic, where there's some lack of, of locality. Um, and you can also talk about things that are so-called symmetry-enriched topological phases of matter. So examples of these would be like topological insulators. Um, and uh, well, anyway, these, some of these recent things are, are described by symmetry enrichment. Um, so what that means, basically, is that it's in a topological phase. But um, if you break some symmetry, then it becomes trivial. It's no longer topologically protected. Um, so some hallmarks of what topological phases of matter look like. Um, one, sort of the one that I tried to emphasize already is that sort of um, it's topology and configuration dependent ground state degeneracy. Okay. So the Hilbert space that's describing these systems, uh, 
don't depend on anything except for the topology and the configuration. So in, in a moment, we'll see some examples of this uh, very explicitly. Um, long range entanglement. So um, we have this nice um, fact that entanglement is um, quite robust. Uh, this idea of fractionalized charge. So the idea here is that these particles are not the particles that we're used to, bosons and fermions, which have integer charge. These have fractionalized charge. Okay. And um, the, one of the things that I especially study are the uh, exchange statistics. And one of the hallmarks of topological phase of matter is that they have non-trivial exchange statistics. And I'll say exactly what this means. Um, now, one reason that people are really studying these deeply these days is because there is a chance that one could build a quantum computer based on these systems. And they would be, if you could do so, they would be inherently fault tolerant. So uh, this idea that sort of to how topology gets involved is that the, uh, the states are topologically um, protected from decoherence. Uh, kind of the basic idea that I like to tell, like when I'm giving a talk to undergraduates, is to say, well, think of a knot. Okay? If you can encode information in a knot, somehow, whatever that means. Well, uh, a knot, well, what is it? It's a circle that's been sort of tied back to itself and, and sort of has some, some crossings. And if you slightly perturb this knot, it stays the same knot. It's the same knot, uh, regardless, as long as you don't actually push two of the strands through each other. So this is how topology is supposed to help us with quantum computation. OK, so let me give a quick example of um, topological phases of matter. So the so-called fractional quantum Hall liquids are expected to be examples of topological phases. So what are these? Well, it's, um, it's really effectively two-dimensional. So what happens is you have some, uh, some material, and um, you drop the temperature down. Let's see. The... OK, there we go. To like 9 millikelvin. Okay. And so that's low energy for sure. Yeah. So the, the effect of this is that so you have some electrons that you can pack on here, quite a few. 10 to the 11th electrons per square centimeter. So you, right, things are going really slowly, so you can have a lot of electrons. And the, the energy is so low that the electrons, uh, it's sort of energetically unfavorable for them to move in the transversal direction. Okay. So it's effectively two dimensional. And then what do you do? Well, you apply some transversal um, magnetic force, quite big, 10 Tesla typically, and what, can appear are these quasi-particles. Okay? These um, sort of, if you like, holes or mountains, if you one of the two, um, in this uh, sort of distribution, this sea of electrons. And uh, they behave like, quasi like particles, except that they'll typically have fraction charge. So this has been studied going back quite some time. And so I think the 1998 Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of the fraction of quantum Hall effect. And so this is, this is one area, something that's existed for some time that we expect indeed has, uh, is a topological basis of matter. Okay. So now let me get to the point about exchange statistics. What are anions? <coughs> well, uh, if you have point-like particles, in three dimensions, we all know that they are either bosons or fermions. Okay? And the way to sort of describe that in terms of uh, exchange statistics is to notice that if you have uh, the wave function and you apply um, a flip, so that means I'm going to interchange these two particles. So this is the wave function of uh, identical particles at positions Z1 and Z2. I exchange their positions. And what can occur is you can get a phase. And if it's minus 1, those are fermions. If it's plus 1, those are bosons. Those are the standard Bose and Fermi statistics. Okay. So in particular, if you think about it as the, a process, maybe where time goes up, 
you have these two bosons or two fermions, when you interchange them, it doesn't matter whether you sort of in space were to interchange them this way or if you were to interchange them this way. It doesn't matter. You would still get the same thing. It's either a plus or minus one uh, on the wave function. So that's all one can sort of see. And, um, well, why mathematically do we say that? Do we understand this? Well, it turns out that if you think about if your space is three dimensional and your time is one dimensional, the trajectories of these bosons form some kind of, um, well, some, some braid. And even if you were to close them up, so you start, maybe you, you start at some fixed point and then you break, take them apart, particle anti particle duality or something, and then close them up, back up again, then you'll get some curve that is, well, knotted in R4, but you can always undo this because you have this extra dimension. So this is another mathematical explanation of why, in three dimensions, we only have bosons and fermions. There are no knotted curves in R4. In R2, however, interesting things can happen. So you can have something called anions, and in particular, you can have something called abelian anions, where when you interchange the positions of your two identical particles, it can acquire a phase. And this theta here is representing sort of any phase, and that's why they're called anions for any. So it can be sort of any phase. Actually, it has to have a finite order, but almost any. Yeah. OK, so that's what uh, abelian anions are. So they're, they're exchange statistics, acquired a phase, and it could be anything. Um, on the other hand, it, it's possible that the state space is degenerate. It can have dimension bigger than one. And in this case, right, so you have some, the, the vector, uh, the vector space of possible states, configurations, but as high dimension, when you interchange these things, well, you could, instead of ending up exactly where you started again, except with a phase, you could find yourself in, in some superposition of other phases. So the idea is that there could be, right, uh, so this J uh, goes over the dimension of the state space. And that's how we can possibly get non-abelian anions. And I'll explain why this um, sort of degeneracy actually implies that they're non-abelian in a moment. What do we really mean by non-abelian? We just mean that um, if we were to interchange them in one order or the other order, um, you can actually get a, a representation of the Bray group that has non-abelian image. That's really what it says. But we'll get to that. So I wanted to point out two things about this. So um, one is uh, these are robust. So let me explain what I mean by that. Well, if I take uh, either one of these paths, C1, C2, or C3, then the, the system won't detect the difference. You won't be able to measure a difference between these two <coughs> paths. And so it's quite robust. You don't have to be very careful, in some sense, about how how you draw your circle or how fast you do it, etc. The other thing is that there's some non-triviality. For sure, you can topologically detect the difference between this curve, this path that this anion might take, and this path. It's impossible to sort of deform one into the other because you're confined to this two-dimensional plane, and you can't get over this hole. Think about it, it's like having like this table, if I were to put a nail in this table and throw a loop around it, I could never contract that loop down to nothing, down to a point. So that's, that's sort of part of it. There's two things. One is non-triviality. These are distinguishable, and it's robust. It sort of topologically, we only care about topology, and so we uh, C1 and C2 are, are really the same. OK, so how do we model bosonic 2D topological phases of matter? Well, um, we more or less know how to do this. So the basic idea is we use a um, TQFT, a 2 plus 1 dimensional bosonic TQFT, to be specific. What does this do? Well, the uh, kind of idea in two dimensions is sort of what are we what are we facing? We're facing uh, surfaces, 
like a disc, or maybe a torus, a sphere, and there can be holes in the surface. So to any such thing, we want to be able to assign a state space. All it should depend on are, well, what are the specific anion types living on this surface, and what is the surface itself. So it should only depend on configuration and topology. And so we should have a way of assigning to a given configuration uh, in, a, in a unique way a uh, Hilbert space. And so that's what this it does. That's exactly what a TQFT does. And then what we think about is of these punctures is we think of them as like a boundary component. So if you think about any surface, any compact surface, what is its boundary? Well, it's a collection of circles. That's all it can be. Take a disk, right? Its outer boundary, that's a circle. And you take a torus, it has no boundary. The surface of a donut has no boundary, but you can put a hole in it, perhaps. So, uh, and then each of these boundary circles is meant to be labeled by some color or some anion species. So each of these boundary components you can think of them either as a boundary or as an actual, just like a hole, but with some, some diameter. Um, uh, there's an anion sitting there. And so that's what the label set is. And there will always be one label, which is we call neutral, which corresponds to no hole at all. And you can put one in any time you like and take it out any time you like. It corresponds essentially to the vacuum state. So um, how does this work? Well, so it turns out that then the dimension of this Hilbert space exactly is equal to what we call the ground state degeneracy. It's just essentially the definition. Okay. So if we have, say, this torus with six holes labeled by A through F, then, well, we get some Hilbert space. And we want to do this in a nice, consistent way, and there will be some rules. Where do the rules come from? Well, they come from quantum mechanics. So let's see. So here's one principle that we all know. You take to the state space of a, sort of a composite system, the state space should be uh, the tensor product. So the interpretation is, well, if you have two of these that are physically separated, the Hilbert space associated with this is just the tensor product of the corresponding number spaces. In this case, they're identical, so you get the same space. So this is what's responsible for entanglement. So locality. So bosonic systems sat satisfy this locality principle. And the idea is that the global state of the system is determined from local information. In some sense. What does this mean? Well, it says that if you have if you're trying to understand what is the Hilbert space associated with some surface with marks on it, holes, then uh, you should get it by summing up over the histories. Yeah, it's like Feynman's idea, yeah. And what is the history? Well, think about it. If I have a torus, yeah, and I want to understand, well, where did it come from? Well, one way of getting a torus from simpler things would be take a cylinder yeah, and glue the two ends together. <clears throat> and so that says that the Hilbert space associated with the torus should be some direct sum over the Hilbert space associated with cylinders. And so that's exactly what this locality and so, for example, here is a torus actually with some punctures. Here is um, where it might have come from. And here I have sort of a variable label because I don't know what I glued together. I don't know what, uh, what it is, so it's just x. And it turns out you need to take the antiparticle here, x dual. You glue them together. Well, then the Hilbert space of this torus with holes is the direct sum over all of the possible labels, all the possible anion types uh, associated with this, the Hilbert space that we would get here. Okay. So now what this tells us is that we can sort of take any complicated surface with high genus and start chopping it into pieces. And all we'll be doing is some kind of direct sum. And well, if those pieces are separate, there might be a, uh, a tensor product as well. Okay. So it's just a sort of set of rules of how to do this. What are the basic pieces? Well, uh, it's a mathematical theorem that says if you have any compact surface with boundary, uh, it can be obtained by gluing together 
three different kinds of things. Discs, annuli, same thing as a cylinder, and pairs of pants. It's called the DAP uh, decomposition. And so all I need to tell you is kind of the initial conditions. What, what do I assign to these three things? So to a disk, I'm always going to assign the trivial vector space, the zero dimensional vector space, unless the boundary <laughs> is labeled by the neutral label. In other words, if it's a sphere, here, which is a disk with the boundary sort of not there, uh, then it'll be one dimensional. Otherwise, it's zero dimensional. And this actually comes directly from quantum mechanics. You, you think of this as a quantum process. You start with um, sort of the vacuum. You cannot produce a single particle out of the vacuum. You can only produce particle antiparticle pairs. And that's what this next axiom says, is that indeed you can do that. Now, since this is topology, I just draw this as this annulus. But notice there's two boundary circles. And you can think of this as a cylinder, anything you want. You can change anything but the topology. The geometry doesn't matter. And so in this case, uh, it's just exactly saying that I can draw a particle-antiparticle pair of anions out of the vacuum. And so what this says is that, well, if these are not dual to each other, they're not particle-antiparticle pairs, then it should be trivial. Otherwise, it's one dimension. So that's the disk and the annulus. Finally, the pair of pants. <coughs> this is, if you like, a sphere with three holes in it, topologically. And you have three labels, A, B, and C. And so to this, we must assign a Hilbert space. And we assign a Hilbert space of dimension something in A, B, C. It only depends on the labels A, B, and C. And so we can do this. And well, that's where different uh, topological phases of matter can show up because you have some freedom here. This in A, B, C is some kind of choice that has to satisfy some things, but there are possibilities. Okay, so now let me sort of back up a little bit and just sort of say, as a mathematician, how do we actually think about topological phases of matter or anions? Well, the sort of very short answer is we think of them in terms of modular tensor categories. Okay. Not particularly helpful, but that's the answer that we could give You know, if you're in an elevator with somebody. How do you think about them? Well, modular tensor category. They get off at the next floor. So, uh, so let me let me say a little bit about what this is and sort of in pictures anyway. So the topological charges, so these anions, that's this finite label set. Okay, and that finite label set has a role to play in uh, modular tensor categories. The state spaces correspond to well, we think of the configuration because that's all that really matters. So here would be like a disk with um, a bunch of A labels in the middle and then an outer boundary labeled by B. That's a state space. Okay. And then there are some very specific fusion and splitting spaces. These are vector spaces, so they'll have bases. And this is how we think of the bases. This is a, a fusion space. So I'm thinking of these two as being labeled by A, and then I'm going to end up with C. So this is like a quantum process where I take uh, anion type A, anion type B, and fuse them, and you can get different things out. You can get a C, maybe something else. But anyway, that's what this is. And the splitting space is the opposite direction. I can start with C, and then there's a quantum process that starting with just C, I could produce a pair A and B sometimes. For example, C could be zero, A could be B dual. That would be an example of such a picture. Then we have fusion matrices. Since there's a finite collection of colors, finite set of labels, then I can just make a matrix that corresponds to, well, what are, if I fix A, what are the dimensions of all of these Hilbert spaces uh, associated with uh, the fusion space? I'm going to take A, fuse it with B, see how many times I can possibly get C, how many different ways, and then uh, run over pairs BC. This is a matrix. Braiding. 
So what is this? Well, this is exactly particle exchange. So if I take particles type A and B and I interchange them, well, what is, what is this really doing? Well, it's operating, it's an operator on a Hilbert space. So, well, this is exactly how we look at it. We take one of these basis guys for C into AB, or rather into BA. We interchange them. I'm still in that same Hilbert space, and so I will be some multiple of some basis vector and some coefficient. Um, there's something called quantum dimensions that plays an important role. And this is exactly the idea where I start with the vacuum, I create an A, A star pair, and annihilate them, and do some measurement, sort of see some kind of probability, and this corresponds to a quantum dimension. Okay, so the Q dimensions really are what we call the loop values. And you can also do something else, which is called a twist. And the idea here is, well, these circles, they, uh, these boundary circles, they're not single points. They're circles, they have a little diameter. And so I could make a process where, I, so I'm going to blow up what I had here. It's not like this. So here's the diameter of my circle. I could do this, right, and sort of do that process. And that's sort of the same thing as, as this sort of doing the loop, called the twist. Okay. This thing that I've drawn as a line, you should really think of as being having a little bit of width. So I could take off my belt and show you how these two things are the same, but I won't take the time to do this at home. OK, so this is kind of how we think about these. Now, why do we think about them in terms of categories? Well, let me just make a little philosophical interlude about categories. What are they? Well, um, in a category, you have essentially two things that are important. You have the objects, which are assumed to be mysterious things that you don't have access to, but they're there. Okay? They have no assumed structure. They're not vector spaces or points or something like this. They're just objects. What's important, how do you sort of look at them? Well, you look at their relationships. And the space of relationships between two objects, those are the morphisms. So, that's the other thing that one has. Now, the morphisms actually do form a set. So the collection of morphisms is, an, is a good thing. And in fact, for me, it'll actually be a finite dimensional vector space. So morphisms are where everything is happening. The objects are these mysterious things that, well, we can't really see, but we can sort of probe in some way using morphisms. So indeed, why? Why are categories appropriate for uh, thinking about quantum mechanics. Well, let me give you one principle of category theory, which is sort of an overriding principle. And it was in a paper of Kapernov and Lobotsky. Said, they say that in any category, it is unnatural and undesirable to speak about the equality of two objects. In physics, this, you know, so you, I have a boson here and I have a boson here. What does it even mean for them to be equal? It has no sense at all, right? This one's over here, this one's over here. They can't be equal, but maybe there's relationships between them. And so that's kind of a principle in quantum mechanics as well. Distinct quantum objects are distinguished by the responses to transformations, measuring devices, quantum processes. Equality makes no sense. You can distinguish things by saying, well, these are really different, but equality is sort of silly. And so category theory is, is really quite a good uh, setting for this kind of question. Now, since we're not talking about, so you can't put all of quantum mechanics into this framework because, of course, there are dynamics and things that can happen. But at, at least at some level, uh, categories really are the right thing to think about for quantum mechanics, precisely for these principles. And particularly when you're talking about topological phases of matter, where we don't really care a whole lot about the geometry or the dynamics, it, it turns out to work very well. Right? So the conclusion of this is that the objects, say anions, right? The objects in the category are like these objects that are sort of mysterious, like anions. Okay? So these are the sort of quantum states. Now notice I'm distinguishing. 
a quantum state, usually when we talk about a quantum state, we think of a vector, right? No, no, that vector describes that quantum state, but the quantum state itself, right, is something else, something mysterious. The vector, well, that describes the measurements that we could do on it or the, you know, the information that it contains. And then the quantum processes, these are exactly the morphisms. So, for example, I think of braiding particle exchanges as a quantum process. It's a process on a quantum system, and well, those will be morphisms. Okay, so this puts us on pretty solid ground in terms of why quantum mechanics and uh, and categories sort of really do have some. Question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. What about uh, components? Like uh, initially, you could have some So, um, so it, I believe that one could interpret this in terms of, of this, this framework. The process of this decay, that's a morphism in some way, right? You're going sort of from one system to another system. Now, maybe it's better to think about it as like some kind of phase transition, right? And we also can describe phase transitions, which is a change. It's at a higher level. It's between one category and another category. Okay, easy. And yeah. the very quantum problem is like no, so yes, right, right. So, uh, right. So, entanglement in particular, um, for me, says that well, it's this tensor product of two Hilbert spaces. Okay, so you have some Hilbert space describing this particle and this particle, and you sort of put them together in some way. Your two systems. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. You, you can interpret in this way. So, like, let's say you have a two-level system, two of them, right? Well, uh, you can think about um, those as being, um, right, so the actual states uh, are something mysterious, but the what we would call states are like the vectors, right, in these spaces. And it's just entanglement comes from the fact that, well, when you put these together, Hilbert, uh, the quantum mechanics tells us it should be uh, a tensor product. So yeah, certainly, certainly this this framework does work. But I should warn you, it, it really is kind of um, many times, as I say, it's sort of philosophical because you sort of when you actually want to do computations, there's some serious things to be done. But we know how to do them. That's what this slide sort of says here, right? Here we have vectors and Hilbert spaces, and we're computing matrix entries, things like this. So you really can get a hold of things. In this yeah, okay. Precisely, in, in the previous slide of this, yeah. you told us that uh, the fundamental structure is the disk, the tube, and the particle. Yes, that's right. And having this in mind, uh, if you have a component system of particles which are valid, yeah, yeah. it's hard to, to see how to use these fundamental uh, elements to control them. Right. Yeah. So, um, Basically, the idea is that these, these pictures here, they, the configuration that should correspond to some Hilbert space. Now, what I'm talking about specifically in these pictures is topological basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe there's some disconnect from that reason. Um, it's the topology that I'm talking about yes. with the disks. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, uh, about the quantum mechanics, because you mentioned that you have this Maybe the main point of my talk should be that, well, we should we should not uh, dismiss categories. Uh, we really, I think it's becoming more important. In fact, this has been realized at least by some people in the mainstream media. So there was this article in Forbes magazine, right? Which is the magazine that rich people buy so they can look and see who their friends are. Um, so, right, so this is all about sort of money, but somehow this article made it into Forbes and has this rather compelling title from my perspective that the future will be formulated using category theory. Okay. And they, they make a reasonably compelling argument. They're actually talking about biological systems here. So it's, it's, it's quite robust and useful in many settings. Uh, but anyway, this is quite recent. This is just July of this 
Okay, I'm going to say a little bit about what modular categories are. Um, and uh, it'll look like a little, but it's actually a lot. So this is what a, a modular category is. So uh, like a mathematician, I just give you a bunch of words, each of which has its own definition. Uh, but a modular category is monoidal, semi-simple, linear, rigid, finite rank, spherical, braided, non-degenerate. All of these words have physical interpretations. Monoidal just says that there's a such thing as a tensor product. Now, I'm not talking about tensor product of Hilbert spaces. I'm talking about objects. So the category has some notion of tensor product. Uh, and there's also a unit object, which you can think of as being something that when you tensor with anything else, then you don't notice the difference. So that's the monoidal. Semi-simple just means that everything can be decomposed into simple things. Uh, linear just says vector spaces. Rigid has to do with duality. Finite rank says there's finitely many possible colors and labels. Spherical is a bit technical, but it essentially says that you can put these things on spheres and uh, it sort of makes sense to push a line around the back of the sphere. Braided is exactly this particle exchange. And non-degenerate is a bit tricky um, to explain, but basically it says that the braiding itself is non-degenerate. Okay. Now, like if you take fermions or bosons, their braiding, I would call that degenerate because it's not very interesting. But there's a, a sense in which you can uh, put this. In fact, there's some matrix that should have non-zero determinant. Really can be explicitly made. So here's an example of something that is very nearly a modular category, but just fails to be modular because of degenerate rating. And that is, take a finite group, any finite group, symmetric group on seven letters, and look at its uh, category, or look at the set of uh, representations, okay. finite dimensional representations. So what are these? These are just homomorphisms from your group to uh, some matrix group exactly what representations are. Well, you look at all of these representations, you can do lots of things with them. You can tensor them together. Uh, you can decompose them sometimes. Uh, there's a such thing as a dual representation. All of these things do show up. You can even sort of interchange. But it turns out that interchanging is, in this case, trivial. So one question is, yes. this modular category doesn't depend on the space time or the surface where your objects are defined. No, this is a purely algebraic thing. Um, the, the, so eventually, I'll, I'll say that if you have some uh, topological phase of matter, and it's appropriately bosonic 2D, uh, there will be associated with that a modular category. So the modular category will actually model the quantum system. And then it, then it matters. So there will be different kinds of modular categories for different systems. Does that answer your question? Uh, more or less. I mean, I don't. Uh, I would like to know if, if there's some dependence on the space time or of the space time. Uh, yeah. So it turns out modular categories will be used only for two dimensional, two spatial dimensions, oh, okay. and okay. one time. Yeah, okay. yeah. There are other things we can use in other other. So the key connections are that the anions correspond to sort of irreducible representations. Um, the Hilbert space associated with a disk with holes in it is some Hom space, morphisms between the trivial representation and the tensor power. These fusion matrices are, again, dimensions of some Hom spaces. This quantum dimension is actually the spectral radius of this matrix. So all of this can be sort of put on strong footing. Um, I won't say much about this, but I have a dictionary between anionic systems and categories, and this is essentially it. Everything has its own interpretation. Okay? So um, like particle exchange is braiding. Observability, in other words, distinguishability of anion types turns out to be related to some non-degeneracy. So there's lots that goes into this, but the point is we have a complete understanding of how these correspond. So um, let me ask a few questions, and we'll see how many we get to. But what I want to say is that 
this looks like very high level and, and sort of um, abstract stuff, but can you actually answer questions? Like if somebody, some computer scientist comes to me and asks me about some quantum information question, can I interpret it through my model and potentially give them an answer? And I claim that the answer is yes. So the first question is, well, suppose a physicist comes to me and says, well, I have this thing, it's in topological phase, and I've been able to detect that there are six distinguishable anion types. Okay, could happen. And then you might say, okay, what's the modular category that models this thing? Are there infinitely many choices just with that information? So how do I sort of go to my periodic table of topological phases and tell him what, what, he's, you know, what the model is? So that's a question. Well, they're finally many, that would be important. Um, when is an anion non-abelian versus abelian? How can you tell the difference? How do you model phase transitions? This one I'll probably skip, but we do have a, a way of getting to it. And when is an anion universal for quantum computations? And this is a pretty important question. Um, and we have at least a conjecture. And can we achieve universality by doing something more than braiding if you don't have a universal? So if your anion is not universal, what can you do? So these are all questions that people ask me at Microsoft, for example. Um, and well, we, we went away and we, we worked a bit and proved theorems that then helped. So let me give you an example of a modular category which is really popular right now. It's called the easing. So it has three particle types. It has the vacuum, it has a fermion, and it has something called the uh, Ising or Easing or Majorana anion. This fermion here is supposed to be the famous Majorana anion. Okay? So if you go to the archive and just like put in Majorana fermion, any given month there's probably 30 papers. Okay? So this is something that they're really working hard on trying to realize. So this is the the so-called fusion matrix for this um, Ising anion. It has dimension, quantum dimension square root of two. It turns out to be non-abelian. Another example is the one-third Laughlin state, which is, corresponds to uh, this fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, so this, these are abelian. The famous thing that you'll see a lot is called the toric code. This has, uh, so it's Kataev's toric code, this has four uh, particle types, uh, distinguishable, and you have um, a couple of bosons and um, a fermion as well. Anyway, some interesting things. Uh, there's a famous thing called the Fibonacci theory, which has just one non-trivial particle with quantum dimension, the golden mean, and it's actually universal for quantum computation. If you can realize this in the lab, you would have a universal quantum computer. And another example is like the Z3 parafermion. So the point is all of these things that come up with, uh, they come up in, in physics, uh, in, in these um, condensed matter systems, we have a model. So um, here's a quick answer to the very first question. How many models exist for a given fixed number of distinguishable anion types? It turns out there's five and many, and so we prove this few years ago. And the way we interpret it, we turn it into a question about modular categories and prove that there's finitely many of a given rank. Um, let me show you a picture of, so a lot of our proofs will often involve pictures. And so here's a proof that just knowing degeneracy, in other words that this Hilbert space has dimension bigger than one, is enough to prove that the uh, the braiding is non-abelian. And so the pictures look like this. So here I've taken, I start with, so you sort of time goes up, I start with the vacuum, I create a pair of uh, B part type particles, and I have one A particle, I do some um, braiding, and it turns out that one can then use sort of the yoga of, of modular categories to say that, well, this is some non-zero constant multiple of this vector, whatever that is. If, however, um, the two braidings commute, then 
you do it a similar computation that says, well, if they commute, you can just replace all of these crossings with straight lines, essentially. And so you get this picture. But then there's a rule that says, well, if I start with the vacuum, I can't produce a single B-type anion. B is a non-trivial anion. And so this has to be zero. And so there's a contradiction. So that's actually a picture proof that degeneracy implies non abelian I'm going to skip phase transitions. It has uh, it's a, um, it's a bit that goes into it. There's two different kinds. Um, let me say a little bit about the brain group representations. So this is the brain group. It's uh, generated by these pictures, and um, they satisfy these relations. The brain group acts on these punctured disk spaces by a particle exchange, so we get a representation. And then the question, well, so this is what the model of uh, topological quantum computation might be, is you initialize, you braid, and then you fuse. Um, and so the question is, when is an anion universal? And it turns out that we can test these two, come up with a conjecture that says, well, that they are, it's universal, essentially, if and only if the <coughs> sort of the dimension squared of this anion is, in this case, I'm turning it around, is not an integer. So it's, in fact, finite energy given all So we, we have this interpretation in terms of universal things. Um, I can, I'm going to go through this rather quickly. This just is, what braids can you get? So what matrices, what gates can you get from using anions? And it turns out that the answer is not enough. Um, and so uh, what do we do with that? Um, you can recover it, and there's a few different ways. One is to change the topology, take something and turn it into bilayer, and so now we have something that has uh, sort of different topology than just a, a disk. It has um, handles, like this has been done. So there are different ideas of how to do this. Um, we can also, so yeah, so the thing I wanted to, why I'm going through this rather quickly is I want to get to uh, mentioning that we can move our dimension. We can change to three dimensions. Um, and so let me just draw some pictures of what this looks like. So of course, point-like particles in three dimensions, we saw it's useless, right? It's not interesting. But you could have loop-like particles, right? And now everything opens up again. Something interesting could happen. What do we mean by that? Well, I could have in some ball some loops, and I can do some exchange with them. Or I could have a configuration like this, where there's a bunch of loops, vortices maybe, bound in some way to another uh, sort of circle. And we can study the motions of these. And indeed, we're doing this. And then, let me just say that, well, we have quite a broad set of things that we can look at. This is the story that we understand relatively well, modular categories to bosonic topological phases. But all of these different pictures, even fermionic things, which are non-local, which means if a particle travels across here, it acquires some sign, if it goes twice, it goes away. Um, symmetry and rich topological phases of matter, you can imagine um, different configurations. But we do have a category type thing, not necessarily a modular category, but maybe a G cross braided fusion category or a super modular category that will help us describe these things. And so uh, the point is, all of these systems, we have a categorical way of understanding. And so let me just go through the executive summary of what I hope people may become away with. So modular categories do model something, topological phase of matter, two-dimensional bosonic. You can analyze questions in terms of these categories and really actually give answers. Um, there are some good reasons to study topological phases of matter beyond this two-dimensional bosonic system. Categories still provide good models for these. So I'll stop here. Here's some references. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, we have time for several questions. <clears throat> what is the rule of time in this approach of the code? Yeah. The dynamics of the code. Right. So um, for us, it, for example, we're thinking about two-dimensional systems. Um, then, so our, that's our physical system is two-dimensional. 
but then uh, time is an extra dimension. So, for example, if I have two particles, maybe in the plane, and I physically interchange them, right? That's all happening just in the plane. But if I include the time direction, the trajectories of these particles are a braid. And so time plays this role. That's why we call it, we usually say a two plus one TQFT or a three plus one TQFT, because that one represents time. And so it really is a time evolution, right? Is a unitary operator, except possibly from your talk. Maybe it's not always unitary. But uh, at least in these closed systems, we expect that. Okay, yeah. any other question? Can you elaborate a little on the relationship between the universal ions and the quantum computation? Sure, okay, so uh, a universal quantum computer is a quantum computer that is as good as it gets. Yeah. So uh, a universal anion would be the following. It would be an anion so that if we take a disk and we put a bunch of those anions in there and we allow ourselves to braid them, okay, well, that's a quantum process. And so it's an operator on a filter space. So in particular, it'll be a unitary operator. And so that will get us a quantum gate. If that gives us as many quantum gates as we could possibly want, in other words, if that sort of fills out the unitaries, then that's a universal anion. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, comments? Well, there's not more, so the next thing again is bigger.